thank you so much for joining us today on the Watchdog podcast for Mint Press. As you know, we are going against the grain and covering stories which the mainstream media regularly neglect. And it is for that reason that we ask for your support, whether through Patreon or through liking and subscribing or leaving a comment on this video. Now, this has been a momentous few weeks. We have seen the United States retreat in humiliation from the occupation of Afghanistan. And they ended as they started with massacres which were misrepresented by the front pages of the biggest newspapers in the world. Firstly, when people were clamoring upon US airlines and jets to escape the country, you saw a case of people being shot at the airport. And it's clear that the only people that could have done it were the US military. Despite that, you constantly saw these shootings referred to in the passive tense by the mainstream media. Who shot these people? It seems they were shot by invisible men. Then you also saw the bombing which took place, the suicide bombing claimed by ISIS. And in the aftermath, it seems that the United States Marines opened fire, killing many, many people. In fact, there are those at Kabul Hospital who are arguing that more people were killed in the firing aftermath by US Marines than were killed in the initial suicide bombing. Then you have the drone strike, supposedly to take action against those who targeted the airport. Well, the US military killed 10 civilians in that operation, including six children. Overall, this war on terror over the last 20 years has seen the US spend $21 trillion on foreign and domestic militarization. 16 trillion of those dollars went directly to the military, but 7.2 trillion of that 16 million went to contractors. You also saw 3 trillion go to veterans programs and 949 billion go to homeland security and 732 billion dollars go to federal law enforcement. This is the infrastructure that this 20 years of war has built up. During that time, you've seen companies like Lockheed Martin, the, the value of their stocks has increased by over 1,200%. They haven't just profited from the military campaigns in the Middle, Middle East. You know, the war on terror has actually increased people's likelihood to die from terrorism in the Middle East by 4,500%, as has been covered by Mint Press in the past, but also simultaneous to that, the very same companies like Lockheed Martin were involved in the buildup and militarization of borders in both the United States and the European Union. Let's not forget that the war on terror caused 37 million people to be displaced. So the very same companies that benefited from displacing people are the same companies that benefited from keeping people out of, quote unquote, the Western world. We've also seen a continued policy of neglect by the Home Office towards Afghan refugees. Just in the last few weeks, a family of Afghan refugees were placed in a Sheffield hotel, which the fire service claims has unsafe cladding. Customers previously had publicly complained about the unsafe windows in that hotel. And on August 18th, a five-year-old Afghan child, Mohammed Manib Majidi, fell to his death from those unsafe windows. Pretty Patel is yet to make a public statement about the death of Mohammed Manib Majidi. This is yet another example of lethal negligence on the part of those who have a duty of care towards those fleeing wars which were caused by the very same government. In fact, we can see clearly that from Theresa May to Rishi Sunak to Ben Wallace, quite a few British ministers and MPs have worked for or are connected to 
companies that have extracted huge value from the occupation of Afghanistan over these past 20 years. This is something that it is in the public interest to know more about. Our Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, with his crocodile tears, of course, was overseas director of Kinetic, an arms company which made billions out of the occupation of Afghanistan. But also, he has received numerous donations from a lobbying firm by the name of Squire Patton Boggs. Now, the director of Squire Patton Boggs, James Thompson, used to work as in-house legal team for BAE Systems. And BAE Systems actually hired Squire Patton Boggs in a lobbying role for a contract which ended in 2018. Now, these payments made to Ben Wallace, as can be found on the They Work For You website, took place in 2016 and 2017. At that time, Squire Patton Boggs were under contract to the arms company BAE Systems for lobbying services. On whose behalf was that money given to Ben Wallace? The former Prime Minister, Theresa May, her husband, Philip May, works for Capital Group. Now, this hedge fund owned Lockheed Martin and BAE Systems during the Afghan war. As I said before, Lockheed Martin stocks got a return of 1,235.60% across the war on terror. We then look at Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He was a partner at the Children's Investment Fund, which owned part of Lockheed Martin and also um, the parent company of Security Metrics. Security Metrics with a company tasked with collecting 80% of the Afghan population's biometric data by the US government. They are owned by a subsidiary of Saffron. The key shareholders of Saffron are not only the French state, but this London-based hedge fund, which also owns Lockheed Martin, the Children's Investment Fund, at which Rishi Sunak was a partner. And what about the prime minister that launched this war on terror? Tony Blair is paid around a million pounds a year as an international advisor to the Mubadala Development Fund in the UAE. Well, it's been reported that Mubadala were developing a plan to mine one trillion dollars worth of resources in Afghanistan. These all, in my view, qualify as skin in the game. We look at another company which has not only benefited greatly from the occupation, but also the withdrawal from Afghanistan, Serco. The CEO of Serco, Rupert Soames, is the grandson of Winston Churchill. He's also the brother of former Tory MP, Nicholas Soames. And the partner of Rupert Soames, Camilla Soames, is a donor to the Tory party. We also can't forget that their former health minister, Edward Agar, is actually a former lobbyist for Serco. Now, Serco not only has a major contract on the Skynet 5 program with the Ministry of Defense, which buttresses its global communications system, but it also provided logistics and base support services to the Australian army in its occupation of Afghanistan. We also can't forget that the plan to dismantle the military bases in Afghanistan and the contracts to do that also went to Serco, making many millions of dollars out of that, uh, out of that uh, situation. We then also think about the history that Winston Churchill has with Pashtuns and the Durand Line, which separated at that time India from Afghanistan and today separates Pakistan from Afghanistan. When he was on what they called the Northwest Frontier before, Winston Churchill used the following language. He said, every inhabitant is a soldier from the first day he is old enough to hurl a stone till the last day he has strength to pull a trigger. We see in their squalid loopholed hovels amid dirt and ignorance as degraded a race as any on the fringe of humanity. Fierce as the tiger, but less cleanly, as dangerous and not so graceful. 
He also said that Pashtuns had a strong Aboriginal propensity to kill. He said their religion is the most miserable fanaticism in which cruelty, credulity and immorality are equally represented. It is impossible to imagine a lower type of being or a more dreadful state of barbarism. Well, no one thought twice when Winston Churchill's own grandson, Rupert Soames, actually barked at Tasneema Ahmed Sheikh, a, a, a parliamentarian of Pakistani origin. No one bears in mind that this was the same grandson of Winston Churchill who asked him at age five, is it true, grandpa, that you are the greatest man in the world? How have these relationships really gone into the DNA of the economy of our country? Another organization which benefited greatly from the occupation of Afghanistan is, of course, G4S. It's a company that brings in over 600 million pounds of contracts from the government yearly. It also has brought in 10 million pounds in government coronavirus support. And overall, its annual revenue is thought to be 7.5 billion pounds. Now, guess what? John Reid, the former defense secretary of Britain, is one of its um, key advisors and is in a paid position at the company G4S. Also, the prison governor, former prison governor, Tom Wheatley, is another one that works at G4S. And one of the things that G4S would have benefited from was the U.S. Security Armor Group, which is its subsidiary. Now, I must be clear, at the time when this case, which I'm about to refer to, happened, Armor Group was not owned by G4S. But today it is. Armor Group was employed to guard the U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan, and its employees were found to be violating the Trafficking Victims Protection Act by visiting brothels in Kabul during the occupation of Afghanistan. The company Armour Group knew about this. What was the punishment? In the end, all they had to do was pay $7.5 million in a fine to the US government. Other than that, no action was taken. Even when we look at another favourite of the media to focus on in the story of Britain and its presence in Af Afghanistan. Penn Farthing, the uh, founder of this uh, organization which uh, saves stray dogs, Nozad, in Afghanistan. Well, very little attention has been given to the board of his charity. The chair of the board is a gentleman by the name of Dan Tatch. Dan Tatch was a captain in the U.S. military and today is the executive vice president of Hillwood Investments. Now, Hillwood is a company which has benefited massively from the U.S. occupation of Iraq. In its gas and exploration branch, it has put together a system where it aims to increase production to 50,000 50, barrels of oil per day in the Kurdistan region. Hillwood, since 2007, have been benefiting greatly from the US occupation of that country. It's also a company which is owned by Ross Perot Jr. Ross Perot Jr. served in the US Air Force for eight and a half years. He was presented uh, by Ronald Reagan with the Gold Medal Award for Extraordinary Service. He sits on the board of the right-wing neocon think tank the American Enterprise Institute, and he's also the co-chairman of the East-West Institute alongside George Bush. He is the director of the Business Executives for National Security, and his father, the famous Ross Perot, also sat on the U.S. President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. We can't forget that Ross Perot, through his company, Perot Systems, also received a lot of military contracts from the US. He had another subsidiary for Perot Systems, the QSS Group, which had a contract with the US military to develop its information technology systems. And actually, um, before this organization 
uh, led by Penn Farthing, was founded. Perot Systems hired um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Zadzi, a former assistant director of counterintelligence at the FBI. Ross Perot's own politics can be found when we look at where his foundation puts its money. It funds the Anti-Defamation League, which, of course, the FBI in the late 60s um, had internal memos questioning whether the ADL was a proxy of the Israeli state. It also funds the Sherry Blair Foundation, the Langley Air Force Base Memorial, the Air Force Association, the Council on Foreign Relations, the East West Institute, but also the George W. Bush Foundation. You can look at other employees of Hillwood, like the vice chairman, Darcy Anderson. This is somebody who serves as the Texas co-chairman for the Spirit of America. It is a nonprofit organization which raises money for projects in support of U.S. special forces, which are deployed all over the world. You also have the U.S. Army appointing Darcy Anderson, this vice chairman of Hillwood, as one of the civilian aides to the secretary of the army. So what we actually see is contrary to the belief which is propagated by the mainstream media, war is not simply a noble intention, incompetent mistake. Actually, it is a key part of the economics of the way that our countries work today. Our guest is here to talk about really what I see as the poorest people in the world being killed by the richest states in the region, backed by some of the richest countries in the world. We are, of course, talking about the world's largest humanitarian crisis today in Yemen. Nearly a third of all of the strikes carried out by the coalition forces supported by Britain have hit civilian targets. You are talking about 10 to 20 million people, by some estimates, facing famine. 80% of the Yemeni population require humanitarian assistance. Now that is 24 million people. You have rates of acute malnutrition of children under five that are the highest ever recorded. 98,000 children under the age of five are at risk of dying if they do not receive urgent treatment. You have 250,000 pregnant or breastfeeding women at risk of dying without urgent treatment. According to Save the Children, for every one child killed by bombs or bullets, dozens are starving to death. Of course, we know that starvation is a war crime. The depriving of civilians of, an object, of objects which are indispensable to their survival. We have seen that carried out against the Yemeni people by forces backed by the British government. During this period where the Saudis and the UAE and others have launched this war against the Yemeni population, the British arms company BAE Systems has sold over 15 billion pounds of arms to Saudi during this bombing. Ports have been blockaded and vital infrastructure has been bombed. Saudi is the biggest buyer of UK weapons. You have UK fighter jets driven by pilots who have been trained by the British Army dropping UK-made bombs from tornadoes and typhoon jets, dropping Pavely missiles and brimstone missiles that are made here in this country. And in fact, we were told that there were no UK personnel in Yemen, but the Daily Mail revealed that Special Forces soldiers were in fact wounded there, giving us a clue to deeper British involvement than we are told. In fact, a BAE, BAE Systems worker in maintenance said that if it wasn't for BAE Systems and their presence in Saudi working on the planes, within seven to 14 days, there wouldn't be a jet in the sky. We have seen airstrikes by the Saudis and their coalition hit markets, funerals, weddings, detention facilities, civilian boats, even medical facilities and farms. In 2016, there was a cholera outbreak after the Saudi forces had targeted the sewer system and sanitation system. We also know that it has been put that the Saudi army are using British made cluster bombs, which were sold to them in the 80s, which are currently illegal under international law. 
And yet, and yet, with all of this crime, only 49% of the British public even know the war in Yemen is happening. Now, our guest today is really the antithesis of those like Tobias Elwood. Now, Tobias Elwood, the Tory MP, is part of the British Army's psychological warfare unit, the 77th Brigade. He has received donations from both the Saudi government and the conservative Friends of Israel. Yet somehow the government sees it fit that he sits as the chair of the Defence Committee, which supposedly interrogates MOD policy. Our guest today, the complete opposite of somebody like Tobias Elwood, is Ahmed al Batati, born in Yemen, a lance corporal in the British Army. He staged a protest against British arms sales to Saudi Arabia in August and made the point that a child was dying in Yemen every 10 minutes. He not only took that stand, he also set up a charity which works on donating food to people in Yemen. He took on a bank holiday in August, the decision to stand outside Whitehall, dressed in his army fatigues, and blew a whistle every 10 minutes. Within hours of this protest, he was arrested by two members of the Royal Military Police. Ahmed, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. What is the state of your case today? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be sharing the platform uh, with such an honourable uh, gentleman like yourself. Um, the state of my case um, is that I've left the army now. Um, actually, the video that you saw go viral was the last time I actually wore the uniform. Um, I was taken in for questioning and then later on passed to my unit. Um, after I was released to my unit, I told them that I'd refuse to soldier um, because of the reasons that were given in the video. Um, and then an investigation carried out. Um, Alhamdulillah, the charges were dropped. And I think it's thanks to the people that, you know, uh, protested on my behalf uh, for, for the charges to be dropped. Uh, after the charges were dropped, uh, I was given a choice whether to stay in the army or leave. Of course, I chose to leave. Um, and then later on, um, there were rumours to say that I am blacklisted uh, to Saudi Arabia. Um, I don't know how true that is. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if I am, um, but we're yet to find out. Uh, but it would be a shame because I've got relatives in Saudi Arabia and obviously um, I want to carry out my uh, religious practices like Hajj and Umrah. Um, but we're yet to, to see if that's true. As far as I understand, it was COVID and the opportunity to work from home that gave you the time to research a lot of what is actually happening in Yemen. So I have two questions. What were the sources that you found useful in this sort of period of awakening? And also, what do you see as British responsibility for the humanitarian crisis in Yemen today? Yeah, so um, the sources I found out about Yemen more um, was it was trending quite a lot during my time of research and it was during the first stages of COVID. I was less distracted by work because um, we were working from home at uh, them times um, and I had a lot of spare time behind. Before I was distracted by all these, you know, desires, these selfish desires of mine. And it was only that when I fell in love with Islam itself. And don't get me wrong, you know, I've always been a Muslim, uh, but my style wasn't um, as a Muslim. And so it was during the Ramadan period, um, during COVID, and I was really in touch with my religion and I started to practice it more. And one of the duties is that we help the, uh, the poor, the most in need. And that was uh, the, the place I was born in, Yemen. And so we uh, quite 
close friend of mine died um, that Ramadan, Layhamo, and then we, um, me and a group of friends, established this charity foundation for Yemen, um, and we was given back. So we would collect money, uh, get food packages, and send it to the most in need in Yemen. But then I started to research about, like, we started to get reviews back about what we can do more to help Yemen. And the response that we got was the fact that they wanted the war to stop. They wanted something to build off. They didn't want a helping hand constantly. They wanted to build something for themselves. They wanted to see a future for themselves. And that couldn't happen without the war not stopping or the bombs not being dropped. Um, and then that's when I looked into things and then we started to go out on protests to stop the war. And then I found out um, what the British um, involvement was uh, in the war in, in terms of supporting and arming uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, now both sides are wrong, obviously. The Houthis have got the responsibility to carry out um, you know, in, in the war. And then you have the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, um, that are killing innocents, um, you know, bombing hospitals, bombing schools. You know, they bombed the school bus, killing, I think, 32 children. Um, but that's what they wanted. They wanted the war to stop. So I looked into depth about what the British involvement was. And then I felt like a hypocrite because... I was helping these people out in terms of giving them aid uh, to live by. But at the same time, I was ser serving the same government that was putting them there in the first place and had um, some sort of responsibility of why they were there in the first place. Um, so instantly, obviously, I looked into um, what is my responsibility in this. And uh, Islamically, I came across a quote and it said in the Quran, all believers stand firm against injustice, even if it's um, against yourselves. And that quote really hit me. Um, and then that's when I knew that I wanted to leave the army. But before I left the army, I wanted to be heard. Not me, but the Yemeni people themselves, because they didn't have a voice. Um, so, yeah, I took it. Uh, to the streets of uh, turn down the street and uh, I voiced my opinion. Now, if we can go back in time a bit, as a young man born in Yemen, grew up in Sheffield, what pushed you? What were the factors that pushed you towards joining the army in the first place? Um, I think it was the vulnerable stage in my life as a young man. Um, I dropped out of college. Uh, I didn't know what to do with my life. I, was, um, I wasn't disciplined as I am now. Um, and I just felt like a failure. And um, the opportunity came of this job that is, uh, sounds so appealing. You know, you get paid to travel the world. And that it was at the time where they were bringing out these advertisements that you know, the army was a Muslim-friendly environment. Um, later on, I found out that it's not quite Muslim-friendly as they advertise it to be. You know, Islamophobia being the forefront of, of the issue of what you see in Afghanistan, where war crimes are being carried out. Um, the reason for that is because if you look at the recruitment stage, is that they don't um, they don't teach these soldiers ethics. They they go through a fourteen week program to be given a gun and a license to kill. Now, some of these people have never met a Muslim in their life, right? Um, and their only their only image of Islam is um, watching people like Tommy Robinson come out and say. You know, Islam is this and, and, and paint a picture in the head. Um, and I was surprised to see there was a lot of um, supporters within the army of people like Tommy Robinson, Nigel Farage. And when I saw that, you know, red flags immediately 
came up on top of my head. And one of the actual quotes that came into my head is um, something that you said in a track. And it said, if a, if a policeman can kill a black man where he found him, a soldier can kill an Afghan in the mountain. And that spoke volumes because these, these soldiers weren't getting civilians. They were getting pushed into a, a war that they didn't understand. And an image is already in the head of what these people are like. So when a civilian dies, what does the British army do? They sweep it under the carpet. And I'm pretty sure they've done that many times. We've seen that there's footage out there of civilians being killed. But what about the unsurveillance um, incidents or criminal acts? Absolutely. I think also it's important to make the point that you see here that those that have become celebrities from the Islamophobia industry, it's interesting that they never mention an organization like BAE Systems. You know, at one point, BAE Systems had 6,300 employees in Saudi helping with not only maintenance, but also with targeting on these fighter jets, even in the command centers with um, Saudi military personnel. So it's quite interesting the way in which there's a class element to what we're talking about as institutional Islamophobia. Now, of course, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi by the Saudi services was something that all of us are horrified by, and we support justice for Jamal Khashoggi and his family. But the killing of Jamal Khashoggi took place not far apart from the death of Amal Hussein, who was a Yemeni child who died from starvation. Now, both of their pictures were public, but one of them, i.e. Jamal Khashoggi, was an employee of the Washington Post, which is owned by Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world. And so one of them was a more worthy victim of this system. And the other one, you'd be hard pressed to find one person in this country that has heard the name Amal Hussein, for example. But what divided her from Jamal Khashoggi is that she was a child belonging to some of the poorest people in the world. And Jamal Khashoggi was an employee of the richest man in the world. And so the interesting thing about those key protagonists um, protagonists in the Islamophobia industry is they never mention uh, the name BAE, BAE Systems. And they never talk about British arms sales to Saudi. When if you think that they were genuine in their political position, if their political position was actually about Muslims rather than about class war, essentially, then surely the number one target for them would be BAE Systems because BAE Systems are arming the Saudi government as uh, no one else has done before. Let's not forget also that the campaign against the arms trade have launched a heroic fight along with others against the British government on these arms sales. In British law, in terms of arms export criteria, the following uh, quote covers it. It says, if there is a clear risk that weapons might be used in a serious violation of international law, then those arms should not be sold. And so in 2017, the campaign against the arms trade took the case to the High Court in Britain and lost. In 2018, they appealed. And um, in 2019, it was heard in court and they won in the Court of Appeal. At that time, according to Liam Fox, there were 57 arms licenses under consideration to go to Saudi Arabia. But it was found in that appeal that the government had acted unlawfully and irrationally in their program of selling arms to the Saudis. However, um, the government started selling them again on the 7th of July 2020, claiming that they had new mechanisms set up to help them work out um, a sort of revised methodology to their decision making process. And at that time, Liz Truss, the trade minister, actually claimed there was no pattern of behavior in the Saudis' bombings. And actually, 
the examples where there seem to have been serious violations of international humanitarian law were mere aberrations of a more generally clear pattern of behavior. Let's not forget, though, that Liz Trust has been funded by the American Enterprise Institute. Again, that is the right wing neocon think tank that I mentioned before, which is in turn funded by ExxonMobil and uh, the Koch brothers and other corporate interests. So a new challenge uh, was filed in October 2020 by uh, the campaign against the arms trade. And it's really essential that we support them in what they do. And I would call on uh, others who are watching this to definitely support CAT. Now, bear in mind that BAE Systems is so implicated in this horrific war, you've actually seen BAE Systems advertising to children. And we're going to play that video now of what those adverts from the biggest arms company in this country, um, even though it's only worth 0.6% of uh, the British GDP and is hugely subsidized by the taxpayer. This is BAE Systems adverts to children. Welcome to Engineering Fairy Tales. My name is Hannah and I'm an aircraft technician with the British Army. That means I work with helicopters, fixing things from engines to hydraulics or just a flat tyre. I'm going to read you the story of Hansel and Gretel. There are lots of STEM challenges in this story. I hope you can come up with some fantastic ways to help our fairy tale characters. Once upon a time, a father and two children lived by a lake next to a deep dark forest. The boy was called Hansel and his older sister's name was Gretel. So we've spoken about Yemen, Ahmed, but I would like to get your opinion on the British withdrawal from Afghanistan. How do you see that? Well, my opinion is that we shouldn't have been there in the first place. And a lot of soldiers that are currently serving still hold that opinion. Um, definitely it's because of the reason that we left the country um, causing more harm than good. And like I explained before um, of the situation where there's war crimes being carried out. Now, if a soldier, let's just say, carries out a war crime in a village, in a community, where he kills an, an unarmed um, civilian or there's a bombing that kills an unarmed civilian. What, what happens is that their community is traumatized by, by, by this killing or by this tragedy. So what ends up happening is that it creates more violence. It creates more conflicts. It, what it ends up being is retaliation. Um, which leaves the country unstable um, and then forces um, people to resort to things that they don't initially want to do. Um, so definitely my opinion on it is that we shouldn't have been there in the first place and we definitely caused more harm than good. Well, we know also that in Palestine, the F-16 that was used to bomb people in Gaza recently. The HUD technology in it is made by BAE Systems. We also know that the F-35, which Israel claims to have used during that campaign, most of the rear section is put together by the, the company BAE Systems. We also know that David Miliband, while he was foreign minister in 2009, when asked if British components had been used in Gaza in the Operation Castled, he said, almost certainly. Today, we exist at a time where there are 100 companies in this country selling military equipment to Israel. Those are export licenses which have to be stamped by the business secretary. You um, chose to come out, as far as I understand, in support of Palestine action in Sheffield. Let's not forget also that when Palestinians were trying to exercise their right under UN Resolution 194, by returning home, by walking from Gaza to inside uh, the Green Line, 
for them to return home. Uh, in the same period, before and during, sniper rifle components were being sold by the British to the state of Israel. So in terms of where the British government gets resist resistance in its arms policy, it's mainly on the issue of Saudi Arabia and Israel. So what was it that made you speak out and stand in support of Palestine Action, this organization which has shut down numerous Elbit systems, factories, really in a consistent and constant campaign of disruption to the arms trade? What was it that made you stand in solidarity with them? So what made me stand up um, and speak against the injustice that's going on in Palestine is the same reason why I spoke about the Yemen um, crisis um, and the injustice that's happening um, over there. It's we have a voice and we are responsible to voice, um, to be a voice, sorry, of those who are voiceless. Now the Palestinian people are struggling to get that message out there that the oppression that is happening, that other, country, other countries and other organizations are benefiting and profiting out of this. And during the time, obviously, it was a trend and we're seeing that die down now of Palestine is, is being less talked about. We have the information. We know what kind of oppression is happening in Palestine. You know, it's less of an opinion now. It's more of a fact. And the people that choose to ignore it are ignorant or are biased towards their own desires. Um, I think Palestine definitely, um, I've always had love for Palestine. Um, growing up, listening to your tracks, educated the youth about what was going on in Palestine. Um, but I'm so ashamed that I had made a mistake and the mistake was given a lack of education of certain, um, certain systems like BAE systems funding um, the war in Palestine, funding Israel, commit these war crimes. And this is the same system that was funding us and giving us the support. We, we was giving them the power of um, investing in them. And I can remember uh, being in the range and then getting, uh, loading up uh, mags and all you can see is BAE systems and all this, you know, now comes into my head thinking I was part of a system that I did not know about. Um, but yeah, I think that message needs to be put out there of Brit what is British, uh, what is Britain's involvement in what happens around the world, whether it's Yemen, Palestine, Afghanistan. It seems like we are the centre of the problems that is happening around the world. And the reason for that is because we benefit of it, we profit out of it. Well, I mean, bro, you have no need to feel ashamed at all. Um, you are an inspiration to huge amounts of people around the world. Um, you also have to remember that while today we don't have conscription whereby everybody has to be part of the army, we do have financial conscription, meaning that through our taxes, we are implicated in what is happening, especially when you look at organizations like BAE Systems, which are massively uh, subsidized by the taxpayer. So you have absolutely nothing to be ashamed of, everything to be proud of, um, you know, and it's so great to have the chance to speak to you. But on that really topic of others in the army who may feel like you what can we do to help them and uh, assist them in coming forward and stepping out of the war industry structure i think um one of the ways is to stop publicly glorifying war uh, mm. in general um You've seen with the, the advertisement that the army puts out there in, in terms of like attracting gamers, like Call of Duty is a big thing now. We're seeing youngsters um, across the world playing Call of Duty. And here 
hear the, the, the army making that into a way of recruiting people to say as if it's a game to them. Um, I think definitely that is, is one of the ways to, to encourage people to not make the mistake in the first place that, uh, you know, a mistake that they might regret. Another way is um, trying to help those in a vulnerable state because this is what the, the, the British government thrive off. You know, it's, it's, um, it's that vulnerability of, of somebody in the working class that is struggling to make ends meet. And although they don't agree with the system, they are forced to join it to survive. Well, that's what they feel like. But if the public and the society make them um, have alternatives or, or show them alternatives, then I'm pretty sure that their decision would be different for quite a lot of them. I've met people in the British Army and there are, there are, there are a lot of them actually that um, don't even like the Queen. Like they, they generally are serving a Queen that they don't like but they are doing it because of the state of vulnerability that they're in. And it's sad to see. Um, another thing is, is the, the distraction that the army gives you uh, to stay silent. Um, for me, it was without maybe the COVID period, I would have been continuously in a state of distraction where, um, they are praising me um they are because i was good at what i did um it was always a form of distraction is oh the army would give you this the army would give you that so much benefit and if you was to ever leave the army then you'd be in a very um sticky situation or you'd be vulnerable or put vulnerable uh, back into your life, uh, like you started in, to begin with. So they don't they don't give you much of an opportunity to kind of leave the army with some kind of stability, and that's why you see quite a lot of uh, veterans that end up homeless, and that's uh, quite a big thing in the uh, in Britain, and it's because of that. Absolutely, man. I mean, I think also real critical analysis needs to be done on two of the things that you mentioned. Well, three of the things that you mentioned. So number one, I think we need to do a show looking at the sort of computer game to military pipeline that runs from games like Call of Duty directly into the military. We also need to look at the ways in which the state is able to cult cultivate a militaristic mindset from a young age with the military going into schools, um, basically proselytizing to young people about their cause. And then also look at the experience of veterans after, um, after the, the deployments that they've had. Of course, we know in the US that it's literally three to four times more uh, US military people have committed suicide during the war on terror than have actually died in the war on terror. So the question needs to be asked clearly what exactly is happening to people within these structures. It's important to also emphasize what's happening in Yemen is not just about the spectacular violence of fighting between people and bombing of um, kind of traditional military targets. You've seen Yemeni farms hit 918 times in less than three years. That's on average almost one bombing a day. You've also seen Doctors Without Borders have their sites um, bombed by the Saudi coalition. Over half of all hospital and medical facilities in Yemen are either damaged or not functioning. We know that when the German government uh, went ahead with dropping arms sales to Saudi Arabia, Jeremy Hunt, in his capacity in the British government actually went there basically lobbying for BAE systems and the Saudi government, basically saying this would harm the case for BAE systems in still selling weapons to uh, the Saudis. You also have the example of Prince Andrew, of course, who has lobbied a huge amount over the years for BAE systems. So my question 
would be to you at a time where Boris Johnson has found an extra £16 billion for the British military when 1.4 million people have gone through the pandemic with no recourse to public funds, where Marcus Rashford basically had to force him to feed children. What would you say to figures like Prince Andrew, like Jeremy Hunt, who have taken it upon themselves to lobby for the interest of the arms industry? Um, for them, uh, I think it is a judgment that is coming um, and it's something that would um, that they haven't seen or internalized yet. Um, I think that I think they are distracted by what they do um, that they're distracted by what they cause. and I think there'll be a point at a time where they will reflect, on the war crimes that they have committed and the forefront. And then that will be a time where regret will come. And I hope uh, for them, for their own benefit, that it does not come too late. Um, for them kind of people is, um, to go against them kind of people, sorry, is an element of unity, right? And we can't expect them to do the right thing. We can't. And what, what attracts unity is information, right? It's the, the, the right type of, it's the truth, right? And it's people like me and you and society itself, this community themselves that can get together and actually um, voice their opinion and actually do something about it. Now, um, what I would say to somebody that was trying to um, create world peace, right? I would say start off by looking at yourself. Really try to internalize your flaws and what you can change within yourself. Because the minute you become the best version of yourself is the minute that you start to um, implement that with the people around you. And that's how you create unity. Um, mm -hmm. That would be one of the opinions, yeah. Absolutely, brother. I mean, and the other thing in terms of building world peace, a key that we have to do away with, even when we look at the fact that the US military is the number one causer of carbon emissions in the world, would be um, choking the arms industry. You know, research has found that for every $1 billion invested in the arms industry, it produces 11,200 jobs. When you compare that to jobs in clean energy, you'd get 16,800 jobs for that same billion dollars. When you compare it to healthcare, you'd get 17,200 jobs for the same billion dollars. And if you were to use that billion dollars that you invest in the arms trade and invest it in education, you'd get 26,700 jobs from it. So clearly, a lot of the mythology that is built up about the arms trade as a key provider of jobs when you compare it to other more socially useful sectors is completely discredited. Ahmed Al Batati, thank you so much for joining us today. It's really an honor to share this time with you. I hope that you will be able to come back in future. Anything you need, let us know. We are at your service. And you know, I really hope that there are those watching this who are inspired by your example and also take a leaf out of your book to push forward for a better tomorrow. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Thank you for having me, uh, Karim. Honestly, it's a pleasure as always. And if you ever need me, I'm always here. Thank you, bro.